Hello, I'm Timothy Daly, a county extension agent with the University of Georgia Extension in Gwinnett County. The topic of tonight's uh, presentation is good bugs, bad bugs. Most since Insects are the most numerous animals on earth and the most numerous organisms next to microbes. An estimated 100,000 or more of these species live in North America. Probably more than 1,000 insects are in a typical backyard at a given time. The truth is that less than 3% of those insects will be damaging. The vast majority are either beneficial or harmless. Insects play an important role in our ecosystem and they're greatly underappreciated. Insects are uh, basically characterized uh, by having three body parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Uh, they may have two antennas, uh, compound or simple eyes. Uh, they may have wings or not. Some have two wings, some have four wings. And they undergo the exoskeleton, their skeletons on the outside, and they go through growth stages called molting. There are two forms of insect uh, growth development. There's incomplete metamorphosis, where the juvenile uh, resembles a miniature adult, and there's, which is uh, true of what they call true bugs, roaches, uh, grasshoppers, crickets, and uh, insects like that, and then there's complete metamorphosis. That's where uh, the it hatches from an egg and the juvenile form, and then it, uh, it it's it's a crawler or a larval stage, like a caterpillar, and, and it undergoes pupation, and then there's an adult. Uh, butterflies, moths, flies, mosquitoes, beetles, uh, hornets, yellow jackets, bees, and ants. Uh, undergo complete metamorphosis. Uh, we're going to discuss both beneficial and harmful insects, but uh, just to let you know that they are beneficial, but I'm, they're, they're, most of them are beneficial, but there are uh, some that are harmful, and we'll cover them first, and then we'll get through the beneficial and get go to where they really benefit us. And we'll cover numerous uh, uh, pests. Uh, they transmit diseases of humans, domestic animals, and plants, are nuisance pests in and around the home, feed on crop and uh, amenity, uh, turf and ornamental plants. Uh, they, uh, they, they can, they something can cause uh, problems, but most remember 97% or more are harmless. Probably one of the most well-known uh, troublesome mosquito insect are the mosquitoes. There's an example of a common one we have in our area, the Asian tiger mosquitoes. There are many different species. They're troublesome because they transmit diseases. Uh, they're probably the most insect causing the most harm and death in the world. They transmit diseases such as malaria, yellow fever, dengue fever, Zika, uh, chikungunya, uh, several forms of encephalitis, and so forth. Um, besides transmitting diseases, they can just be a general nuisance. Uh, there's male and female insects. Uh, what you're seeing here is actually a picture of a male insect, uh, a mosquito, and that it has those kind of plumose antennas. Males do not bite people. They feed on nectar. Females don't uh, feed on nectar as well and only uh, bite to have a blood mill in order to uh, provide nutrients for their eggs. And uh, mosquitoes for control around the uh, home is best to get rid of, uh, it, I, I would call it tip and toss, get rid of water sources, clean your gutters out. Uh, the fogging can sometimes help with insecticides, but that only lasts temporary. Apply an insect repellents with the chemical DEET in it are some ways to mitigate mosquitoes. This one, if you have pets, you're familiar with fleas. Um, cats and dogs, this is a cat flea. Uh, animals, uh, the, the fleas, they bite uh, and infest animals and they can bite people if they're hungry enough. Uh, 
if you have problems with fleas in your home uh, with an animal, first of all, have the animal treated with, with some form of medication, a flea collar, uh, vacuum the house thoroughly. Uh, there are uh, insecticides that can be used indoors to reduce flea problems, growth regulator type of insecticides that disrupt their growing pattern. Applying an insecticide around the perimeter of your home and yard if necessary. Uh, fleas, um, in the, if you're familiar with the Black Plague of the 14th century, it was because people were living with rats and the fleas uh, would bite the people from uh, the rats. And uh, they got an infestation came in from the Middle East and that's how the flea, the, the disease was spread, the bacterial disease. Uh, get rid of the rats, get rid of the fleas and get rid of the disease. And that disease is still problematic in some parts of the world today, but not in the United States. House flies, I think we're all familiar with these. They're just a nuisance. They're dirty. They uh, spread germs around and they're very, they, they get indoors. And as you know, trying to catch, trying to swat a fly can be somewhat of a challenge. If you look at those eyes, I can see 360 degrees around their head in multiple different wavelengths. Uh, you can, for control, make sure your, your windows and doors are shut tight. Uh, you have screens that, that are in place and they function properly to keep these pestiferous insects out. Also, uh, make sure garbage is uh, in sealed containers uh, to reduce uh, their problem with their infestation and potential for infestation. One that is, uh, you know, ants play, you know, in terms of the matter is ants are very uh, beneficial to the ecosystem because they help till up the soil, they help aerate the soil and allow air and water infiltration. Uh, but some ant species can, several can be very troublesome. Probably most notable are the fire ants. They were um, actually an invasive ant that came in from South America about a century ago in Mobile, Alabama, and it was spread throughout the southeast. They're a very, uh, they're one of the most troublesome pests we have. They inflict painful stings, and their colonies, they can have several hundred thousand ants in a colony and multiple queens. And people can potentially be, uh, can have allergic reactions to these stings. Um, they, for control, um, their mounds, Mowing over their mounds with a lawnmower over a period of time will help will, will help get rid of them. Also, their uh, drenches, uh, insecticide drenches, and uh, ant bait such as the Amdro, uh, which has uh, which is quite effective in controlling ant, these fire ants. Uh, just make like as all pesticides, make sure you follow all label directions and safety precautions. Uh, when you're working out in the, your yard, be very careful where, that you're not accidentally standing in a mound of these. Uh, they'll, you'll find out pretty quick. Also, another type of ant that can be problematic are what we call the sugar ants, the Argentine ants. They don't bite, but they can grow in colonies that get their pretty good size. And they can infest uh, buildings and structures in large numbers. Um, if you have a smaller infestation using those little combat ant, ant traps, uh, ant bait traps or ray will help reduce them. Seal up all cracks and crevices around your home, dispose of, you know, keep food containers and garbage sealed, reduce leaking water sources and keep debris and plant material uh, away from touching your home to help reduce those. Uh, numbers. You, the sugar ant, Argentine ants especially can be problematic in the winter months because they're coming in for uh, for warm shelter. I remember when I was in graduate school at the University of Georgia doing my master's down in Griffin, the building, uh, outbuilding I was in, you could just see the marshes and trails up and down the walls. Now these are, we covered some of the plant ones. Uh, these don't actually uh, harm people directly. But they do harm plants. Um, sometimes they're called plant lice. 
They're maybe a few millimeters long. There's many different types. These are what we call green peat chaffers that get on a lot of things. Um, they're a pierce, they have pure sucking mouth parts. They, they can spread plant diseases. And uh, can sometimes they prefer, uh, they particularly like fresh new growth. Uh, they can distort plant foliage. They also secrete this uh, honeydew that causes the growth of a black sooty mold, such as these uh, uh, here on these crepe myrtles. And aphids, um, yes, they can be they can be problematic, but we're learning a little bit about how certain uh, beneficial insects keep can keep aphids under control. White flies are related to aphids. Uh, they're not flies, but they're in the what we call true bugs, like the aphids. Uh, pure sucking mouth parts. They're especially uh, problematic of sweet potatoes. They can be on gardenias and problematic. Uh, there's a species that's getting on, that's causing a lot of problem in the cotton crop and um, can definitely be a nuisance as well. And they too secrete a, a honeydew that can cause a black sooty mold to grow. A close relative are the mealy bugs. Uh, these are, uh, they sort of have this little cottony, uh, powdery uh, substance on them. They can be problematic, in particular on house plants. They're one of the most common uh, house plant pests there are. And uh, they, yes, definitely can be problematic. Uh, for controlling these type of insects, there's what we call insect killing soap or insecticidal soaps. Safer's one brand of it. Uh, to kill, to get rid of these things, um, spraying that is considered organic. It has, um, it, it's basically uh, related, formulated, uh, it's similar to dishwashing detergent, but it is formulated specifically to kill insects. Do not use this on uh, dishwashing detergent. Don't use that on plants because that could possibly harm plants. But this is one of the best to control these uh, type of soft bodied insects. Lace bugs get on azaleas. Uh, they cause the, uh, they have pure sucking mouth parts. They're on the underside of the leaves. They suck the juices out of the plant. You can see their drop, uh, droppings there. And uh, they get on uh, azaleas, but they also can get on uh, pyracantha, sycamore trees, and lantana. Those are different species of uh, lace bugs specific to those plants. They don't harm the plant, but they will uh, cause the foliage to discolor. This is an example of, of some azaleas that have a lot of lace bugs. It's best to control, uh, they need to be controlled earlier in the season. As you can see in this, the new leaves that are coming out are not infested, it's just the older leaves. And that's when control measures with insecticides uh, that, that can help keep them under control. And that, that'll help uh, improve the appearance of azaleas. One thing azaleas in particular, they like to, they prefer shady, uh, semi-shade environments. And if they're grown in full sun, they're more likely to suffer as a result uh, of lace bugs because they're an environment where they're stressed, where in shady, or in semi-shady or shady environments, they're not as, pro the lace bugs are generally not as problematic. Flea beetles are a particular a problem on what we call the solanaceous vegetables, tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, eggplant, especially eggplant. They uh, chew holes in the leaves and there are several different types of them. And they call them flea beetles. They're beetles, not fleas, but they can jump like fleas. You can see their, their hind legs are a little bit like fleas, like that picture I showed you, and they can jump. They, uh, they like if you have an infestation of them, like eggplant especially has a problem with them. Uh, seven dust that can be used uh, is pretty effective in controlling uh, flea beetles. Squash bugs, pure sucking mouth parts. Um, they uh, get into squash, as you can see one here laying eggs. Um, they, can, uh, they definitely can build up to numbers. Uh, there's various insecticides that you can use. You also can uh, smush them 
Uh, if you see the egg, smash them uh, on the leaves. You see, see the little, it's pretty obvious. Uh, they, uh, they do become problematic on squash. They can also bother cucumbers, pumpkins, and cantaloupes as well, the cucurbits. Army worms, this, uh, well, they are a problem on particularly turf grass. They can be a problem on corn and a variety of other plant material. Uh, there are several different types. There's true army worms, fall army worms. I know when I did graduate work with corn, entomology on corn, this was one of the subjects we were looking at, although this is uh, not a, this is, uh, this is more problem, this pitch, this one is more problematic on turf. On lawns, they call them army worms because they march across, a, uh, they can march across a turf grass like uh, an army uh, and, and chew the grass blades back to the, to the soil surface. Um, them, some years they can build up in very large numbers. It appears the ground is moving, some people would say. Here's a picture of a pasture. Uh, this was uh, coastal Bermuda, which is an animal forage. It was on a 20 acre pasture. And you can see nothing but how the army worms are in such large numbers that they have completely ate up the grass in the pasture. Uh, there's various insecticides that control, uh, you know, lawn insecticides. You know, a lot of times they're granular that you put down in water. One way to determine if you have army worms, if uh, you may not see them, uh, but, uh, if you suspect, uh, one thing, if you see a lot of birds constantly hanging around eating the worms, uh, another thing uh, that you'll see, um, if you get a, a, like some uh, water and pour some dishwashing detergent in it and pour it on the grass, it'll irritate them and they'll come up. Japanese beetles are very familiar with us. They bother a lot of plants, uh, particularly in the rose family, roses, uh, uh, apples, pear, peaches, uh, plants like that. They also, I've seen them chew up grape plants and there are other, they can get on um, crepe myrtles as well. They come out during the summer months and do their damage and then they go away. Uh, they, they lay their eggs in the ground. Uh, do not use those uh, pheromone traps to trap them because that just attracts more of them. Pheromone traps some are used by re, um, commercial growers to monitor insect populations to determine if treatment is necessary, but homeowners don't really need to do that. Japanese beetle, this is their immatures. They have complete metamorphosis. Uh, these are called grubs, beetle grubs. And uh, they can be problematic of turf grasses. They can eat up your lawn, and uh, especially in the late summer and fall is when they're, they can be quite problematic. If you see an area of your lawn and it's starting to turn uh, color, uh, you know, an off color, and you can easily pull the turf grass up, you might be able to see these. And if you have a lot of these, then lawn insecticides can be used to bring them under control. There are several other species of beetles like the green june beetle, the oriental beetle, the mass chafer that also uh, lay their eggs and, and have uh, beetle grubs that, uh, that harm the turf grass. Now this is one, uh, they're pretty much finished their life cycle uh, or, or close to it are the eastern tent caterpillars. They come out during the spring or uh, early spring and they form their webs in the crotches of trees, uh, mostly uh, cherry trees, the wild cherries. I've seen them in crab apples and crepe myrtles on occasions. Um, they, they come out, uh, but they do not harm the tree. Uh, basically, if you just leave them alone, they'll go away or you can uh, tear their nest. See that uh, webbing is to protect them. If you get something and tear it open, it makes them more susceptible to predators like birds. Here's something called fall webworm. Uh, they're, uh, they're similar to the eastern cat, tent caterpillar, but they build their uh, webs on the outer parts of the tree and they come out in the summer and the fall. They prefer pecans, persimmons, and sourwoods. Again, like the eastern tent caterpillar, they do not harm anything. They're not gonna hurt the tree. 
uh, even if they do have a lot of webbing, uh, the trees, especially by the time uh, they, the latter part of the season, they're, they're, um, they've built, they've taken in their energy from the leaves. So uh, these, these worms, it's best just to uh, ignore them. They can be pruned out if they're problematic, if there are problems, but usually uh, no uh, root control is required. Well, this one, termites, uh, these are actually considered beneficial in some ways. That they, uh, they old trees that fall in the woods and die, they help uh, break the wood down because they, they only eat dead wood. They don't eat li uh, loving tissue, living tissue. There's only dead wood. I've had people call me up saying that they're trees. They have termites on them. Uh, that's a sign that there's dead tissue on that tree. Uh, and termites uh, do have a beneficial role in nature. However, they don't know the difference between the wood in your house and the dead tree. So that's, that's where the problem lies. Um, for control is basically to have, you, you need to have a, a pest control company to do initiate control. There's one type, it's called a perimeter insecticide where they spray a, a specific insecticide around the perimeter of your house. On the soil, they use uh, they drill the board into the concrete and bricks and, and cement material. Um, they help get their numbers under control. Uh, then they um, <clears throat> there's another type uh, called uh, the, the baiting stations where the the exterminator puts a bait, a wood bait, in these little uh, cylinder-shaped stations and stations them 10 to 20 feet apart from your home and uh, will come out usually once a quarter and inspect them. And if they find in, if they find evidence of termites, they'll put a poison in there. Uh, some now actually have the poison in there, but still need to be monitored. The, the cost factor is, the perimeter treatment tends to cost more initially, but it doesn't, it only needs to inspection once a year, whereas the uh, Centricon and the other baiting stations do not uh, cost that much to put in, but will need to, a lot more monitoring, a lot more visits from the exterminator, but they use less chemicals. Uh, there are some relatives to insects that I'd like to talk about, spiders, scorpions, ticks, and mites. They're arachnids. They have uh, eight legs, no antenna or wings, two body sections. Some are venomous and carry diseases. The black widow spider is a poisonous spider found in this area. They can inflict painful bites. It can cause uh, illness. Uh, but bites, black widows generally do not, they're not out. They like to be under things. If you have uh, like uh, irrigation boxes or water meter boxes, they can some build homes in there. Uh, they like to be under rocks, wood piles, and things like that. Um, I've had, but bites are quite rare from them. That that doesn't happen very all. It's, it's quite rare. I haven't known many cases of this. I had somebody call me up saying that they had black widow spiders in their garden and they saw them spinning webs. Well, I knew all pandas weren't black widows because Black widows don't do their they don't do their webbing outside. They do uh, under things. They're shy spiders. Another poisonous spider is the brown recluse spider. It inflicts a bite that causes death and or necrosis of skin tissue, and uh, secondary bacterial infections can occur and can create some serious problems. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, in Georgia, these are not common. Uh, they're more common in the north and west of here. Uh, there's some of the northern, northwestern part of the state you'll see more. I do remember uh, an insect, an exterminator brought one in for me to identify, and it was a brown recluse. Out of my 14 years extension, that was the only one I, that, that, I, that I had, and it was uh was found in a house where people had brought some furniture back from the Midwest. So they're really not, but even in, in, in further uh, west of here, these are kind of uh, people sometimes have a false 
uh, perception of them that they're constantly out biting people. Well, they really don't. Bites are not common from these spiders. Uh, you hear that name brown recluse? I like to be hidden and under things. They're not out. Uh, they just bite as a defensive reaction. See, we're, it's like people worry about snake bites. We're not food for these animals, the, these organisms. Uh, the spiders, uh, they eat insects and other spiders. So that's only bitten as a defensive. Now here's a good spider. This is not a poisonous one. I emphasize this is one of the good guys. This is a golden orb silk weaver spider. Quite common in our gardens in the summer. Uh, they spin beautiful webs or they have attractive colors. They catch bugs, but they don't harm people. So if you see this, do not be concerned. Now there's a uh, an invasive one that's come into the state a few years back called a Joro spider. It came from Asia. It can grow up to be four inches long. It's uh, black, yellow, and a red color. But it, again, it does not hurt people, doesn't hurt anything. It spins webs and some people are a little disturbed by its side. It's mostly up like I-85 North in Winnet, uh, Barrow, Jackson Hall, Banks County, places like that. We suspect it came in on some shipping material to the warehouses, but they're harmless. But again, they, they're, the Joros, like the Golden Orb spider, have they're not a threat to anybody. But this is ticks. There are several species of ticks. This is the Lone Star tick. Uh, there's deer ticks and dog ticks. Uh, they, they're known for transmitting diseases. Uh, the deer tick transmits Lyme disease. Uh, that, that is a, that can affect people. It first causes a bullseye rash and then cause arthritis and some other serious problems. Uh, this type of uh, disease is not common in our area. It's mostly up in the Northeast, although I do know of cases where it has happened. If you have a tick uh, that's bitten you uh, and, and then you notice a uh, bullseye rash, you need to get to a medical professional as quick as possible. Uh, but that, again, that's rare that happens. There's Rocky Mountain spotted fever that sometimes spread, although not common in our area, and several others. Sometimes people have a reaction to this. This is the Lone Star Tick, which by the way does not carry Lyme disease. Uh, a few years back, I, I had been hiking in some woods at a state park and developed a rash all over my body that was itching. Couldn't figure out why until I found this uh, attached to my body. And I went to the doctor and was given some medication, but um, it was just a reaction. And I never had that happen to me before. And I have had numerous encounters with ticks. Spider mites, this is a plant uh, pest right here. Spider mites, uh, there are several different types. There's the two-spotted spider mite, the red spider mites, and several spruce spider mites. Uh, they have pierce-sucking mouth parts. Uh, if, they're, if they build up in high numbers, you can, uh, they may have webs on them. It, here's, uh, they cause a discoloration of the plant similar to uh, what the, what the lace bug does to the plant. Uh, if you think you have a uh, plant, they, they infest many different types of plants, but if you think you have it, get a white piece of paper, shake some of the plant uh, material over it, and if the mites are present, you'll see them little dots running around. Here's one. We might know chiggers. Chiggers, are, it's actually the immature form of it that bites people. It's very small. Um, it digs into the skin and causes an irritation. Best course of action if you're out in the woods, and this goes for the for the ticks as well, is to uh, dress up appropriately. You have long pants, long socks on. You might want to consider long sleeve shirts. Wear a hat or something to keep them off your head, and use uh, that. Uh, it, insect repellent that has DEET in it, D-E-E-T, and spray it, if you, especially on your, all over according to label directions, but especially on your pants, because if you're walking through grassy areas, woody areas, that's where you're most likely to encounter chiggers and uh, the ticks. 
So yes, they're out there and there are some things that we need to be concerned about. However, a majority of venomous insects are beneficial or harmless. Um, this is from the May 2020 edition of the National Geographic. You'll miss them when they're gone. Insects are disappearing at an alarming rate that could be disastrous to the plant. So, yeah, I know we just talked about harmful insects, but remember, there's only a few of them, and most are beneficial or, or just harmless. Benefit and value of insects, they pollinate most fruits and vegetables. Um, you know, so much of the, their uh, insects provide that for our fruit trees, our vegetables. There are some plants that are what we call our wind pollinated, like corn, wheat, barley, a lot of trees, some trees like birch, uh, willow, hickory, uh, oak, pine trees. You know, those are the ones that cause the allergies. Like the, and because they produce such copious amounts of pollen that they're pollinated, um, they have to produce so much in order to get pollen, but uh, insect pollinators rarely, if ever, cause allergies. They're also a food source for birds, fish, animals, uh, snakes, frogs, and even in some cases, people. They destroy injurious insects, uh, they're beneficial insects, and, and spiders, which are not insects, can be beneficial. They produce honey, wax, shellac, silk, and other products. They decompose and recycle dead plant and animal matter. Five beneficial roles of insects that you'll see uh, that was in the National Geographic uh, article. They provide, many animals are dependent on insects, important in food chains, birds in particular. They particularly eat the caterpillars and other things. Uh, decomposer, waste eating insects, releasing nutrients in the environment. Our friends, the termites do that. Pest control, predatory and parasitic insects consume harmful, consume harmful insects. Their activities reduce the need for pesticides. Pollinators, again, a majority of plants, particularly crop plants, depend on insects for pollinating. Soil engineers, termites, ants, and other uh, insects are able to transform the soil in hot, dry climates. Their activity aerates the soil, helping it to retain water and nutrients. Lace wings, um, you can see these, especially at night. They're, uh, they they, uh, you can see them flying around the uh, lights at night. Uh, the adults don't, uh, do not consume food. However, their larval form, sometimes called antlion, is a voracious feeder on soft-bodied insects like aphids. And um, as uh, one form of biological control, as you see a lot of these biological controls, they, they control these soft-bodied insects and caterpillars of the, but as well as other insects. Lady beetles are probably the, well, the most well-known. There are several species of them. Uh, they're both the adult and the larval form eat uh, insects. Uh, this right here is a multicolor Asian lady beetle that was brought into this country years ago to control the pecan aphids. And it does a good job of that. However, it, it, during the when the weather gets cold, it likes to come into your home. This is the one that can be a nuisance at times, but it doesn't hurt people. It is, uh, they are prolific. This is a, a immature form of the lady beetle eating aphids. Some people would say, what if I bought, you know, but you see these uh, lady beetles for sale, you get a big container of them and release them into the environment. They're just gonna fly and disperse as they normally do. So as control, they're really not buying them and releasing really doesn't do that much. However, in greenhouse environments, they're very efficient. I know when at Tech, they use them in their greenhouses and for conservatories, use them. Uh, yeah, I've heard of cases of indoor plants using them. People in large, uh, like the Mall of Americas in Minnesota, they had a mealybug problem and they released uh, lady beetles to help control them. In a, a controlled environment, they do well, but not out, releasing them out in the wild. Um, isn't really going to prove anything. Uh, they have natural populations. The problem is sometimes you may have a thousand aphids and only 10 lady beetles. So uh, bio, as biological control, 
they they do pretty good these organisms but they can't get them all but they can reduce their numbers big-eyed bugs this is another one very beneficial especially in row crops like corn and cotton it has pure sucking mouth parts this is a relative the minute pirate bug or aureus uh, feasting on an aphid they also go after caterpillar pests sometimes this one is very small, only a few millimeters long. A braconid wasp. There, there's there are certain, many different species of braconid wasp and related wasps. These are very small wasps that don't sting people. In fact, these are so small you don't hardly you, you, you can't hardly see them. But they're out there, and they uh, like they're parasitized like this to, this uh, tomato hornworm here. Uh, what has happened is a braconid wasp is parasitized, and those are the cocoons of the immature uh, cocoons of the wasp on the body of the, the caterpillar. Um, they're very beneficial to have around, and uh, they help control. Serpid flies are another. These are actually flies. They're not bees. Some people call them bee flies because uh, they look like bees with their flies and they too uh, consume these insects. This is uh, a serpent fly larva going after an aphid. So per, that's one thing is that uh, using insecticides uh, they have to be careful because in some cases harming these beneficials can cause a secondary outbreak. Down in Savannah, there's uh, they they've done all that uh, spraying for mosquitoes of the chemical malathion, and uh, there's a I, I didn't cover them, but there's a scale insects. One is called an Ocutanium scale, has become more problematic on those live bugs because it's killed a lot of the the, the spray and has harmed some of the natural it, some of these natural enemies that I've been showing here that that will help uh, control those insects. Ground beetles, they, um, they're, they're, they're predators on the ground. Uh, they're active at night. You may see them crawling around. They are, they're very beneficial. They don't cause any problems, although they may, uh, unless they wander into your house, if they do, there's what we call occasional invaders. It just lost its way. Uh, you see a lot of these out there. They're very, again, they're beneficial. They'll eat army worms and other pests on the ground. Uh, there's another predatory picture of another predatory ground beetle. Spring Dumbledore beetles. This is actually a type of what we call dung beetles. Uh, this particular, like let's say in cow pastures where they uh, have a lot of cow manure, these will help uh, uh, get rid of the, the manure. They use it for food to lay eggs in. Uh, you can sometimes see them rolling it up into a ball and rolling it away to their nest. So they do, uh, these are what, uh, a class of what we call the scarab beetles. Uh, that's also when the Japanese beetles are in that class. The uh, uh, Hercules and rhinoceros beetles are also in that class as well, or I should say that family. This is probably the best known pollinators are honeybees, which are not native to uh, North America. They were brought over from Europe. They're very, uh, there, they have been bred, and uh, many people raise honeybees, both on, on a professional level as well as homeowners. I wish I, I would like to do that. I just, as of right now, don't have the time uh, to put into it. Maybe one day. Bees are easy. I mean, th th there's a lot of work involved, but a lot of benefits. They are pollinators, and um, their areas. Uh, they play an important role in pollinating, uh, especially our fruit trees and vegetables. When these fruit trees are in bloom, it's, uh, that's when insecticide spray should be avoided. There are places in Cal like California with the almond orchards, the pollination with the, what the native, the honeybees in the wild, as well as other pollinators aren't that good. So they'll truck in honeybees uh, in those net and those um, artificial nests that they have and we'll get them to pollinate it. Bumblebees are another one. What it is is that you can take a look at it. When it goes to a flower, 
It has nectar, the plant rewards it, and you see they have hairs on their bodies that they gather this pollen. And it flies from that uh, uh, flower to another one and pollinates it. Uh, bumblebees are very beneficial. They're quite common, but it kind of, there's also a carpenter bees, which is a little different. Uh, carpenter bees uh, are pollinators as well, but their uh, abdomens are dark and, and tend to be black and, and shiny and uh, do not have hair on it. Mason bees are good, are very good pollinators. They're very small, but they can, they're, they, they're, they're beneficial. And some people build these, have these little mason bee or shelters or mason bee hotels as they're called. You can see on the left, uh, one going into a shelter, a little cylinder shape. There's many different types out there that you can purchase and they'll build their nests in there and pollinate your garden. Now monarch, we're going to talk about some of our butterflies that do help in pollinating. The most famous and well-known are monarchs and they feed on certain species of milkweed. Uh, milkweed and those both this is true of both the caterpillar and the adult. Um, they, uh, they sequester the toxins out of this. It's a poisonous plant, poisonous to us, but not to them. And so if a bird or some other predator tries to eat them, they, uh, they, it'll cause a reaction and they'll spit the insect back out. There are other butterflies that will mimic, that they'll have you, that have evolved to look kind of like monarchs that uh, deter predators. Tiger swallowtail, common around here. It likes to lay its eggs on uh, fennel, dill, and parsley, and it plants like that. And uh, attractive butterflies. Uh, here are some plants that attract beneficial insects. The Queen Anne's lace, yarrow, sweet clover, sweet alisum, buckwheat, dill, fennel, coneflower, and coreopsis. They are very, they, this will attract your beneficial insects. There's a garden with them. A plant a mix of flowers and herbs. Queen Anne's lace, yarrow, fennel, dill, and pensives. And that's uh, my contact information. I can be called or emailed if you have questions or, or anything. Um, any questions? Type in the chat box. All right, well, I have, um, I will have this loaded up onto a YouTube video and available uh, shortly. Thank you very much for attending.